since I was talking about uh, the Lord of the Rings yesterday, Tolkien, um, I'll just sort of continue in a little bit in that vein, uh, where um, Sam is trying to explain to Frodo why they should go on and try to continue their quest. And he says, um, remember when you were a kid and you were hearing those stories? Um, they went on because they were fighting for something. They they believed in something. And Frodo, who's at his, the end of his strength, he's going, what were they fighting for? He's, and Sam, of course, replies that there's good in the world and, and the good is worth fighting for. And Sam's, of course, uh, determination or conviction of that never wavered. And basically, Sam is kind of the real hero of the Lord of the Rings. Some sort of unlikely heroes. Sam and Gollum, really, were the ones that made <laughs> things turn out the way they turned out. <clears throat> Um, okay, there's a couple of other quotes uh, in that regard. Um, Ernest Hemingway from For Whom the Bell Tolls. Um, he's talking about the Spanish Civil War when the, you know a lot of foreign people went to Spain to fight for the Spanish Republic because they believed that they were fighting against ultimately against Hitler there. Historically, I agree with them. He <laughs> um, says, uh, if we win here in Spain, we'll win everywhere. Turns out he was right, uh, although they lost in Spain. <laughs> the world is a fine place and worth the fighting for, and I hate very much to leave it. Okay, uh, same idea as uh, as Sam telling Frodo. Um, there is good in the world, and it's worth making the effort to achieve it. Um, in both cases, he's talking about warfare. Uh, interestingly, in the Spanish Civil War thing, there's a quote from... Um, from um, George Orwell, in Homage to Catalonia, where he goes into some detail about what it's like to get shot. <laughs> Very few authors seem to ever get shot, and uh, <laughs> especially good authors like Orwell, and he actually explains what it feels like, and what the sensations are, and what your um, what your uh, thoughts are, could be at that moment, and he said it's what I remember most was very was absolutely no uh, anger against the guy that shot me. Um, I probably would have thanked him, or, or not thanked him, rather, but congratulated him on being a good shot. You know, the English good sport, eh? <laughs> we kind of taken to weird extremes, but um, I, I think that he was sincere. He, you know, uh, but he said uh, what most per, most affected me, the strongest emotion, was a profound unwillingness to leave this world, which he said, after all, is, is said and done, suits me very much. Both from the Spanish Civil War, I've often wondered if Ernest Hemingway actually read Homage to Catalonia before he wrote uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls, because the quotes are very similar. Um, okay. Variants on the, on the idea that there's good in the universe, or that good exists, or that there is good, in the same way that there is its opposite, or whatever. <clears throat> or, the way I would put it, if evil exists, then good automatically exists. Um... Now, um, and I don't believe in either of them, to be perfectly honest. And when I use the term good, it's hard to put into words what I actually mean, but I think a lot of people understand that. I use the word good very sort of loosely. Um, there is good in the universe. The universe is good. Two different ideas. Orwell goes, um, I like the world. That's totally subjective. Uh, the world suits me, even though he was living in the late 1930s when it looked as though fascism was going to take over the planet, and he still thought, well, it's great in spite of all of it. Kind of Martin Buber-ish. Um, and uh, Hemingway says, the world is a fine place. Instead of saying, I like the world, he says, the world is a fine place. Now, in, in between those two is Sam, who says, there is good in the world. Um... All of these statements are very imprecise, if you ask me, and, and more or less just value statements, just sort of saying, this is what I think. Because um, I'm not really sure that we can say that good exists, or that evil exists, or bad exists, or anything like that. They're just terms that I guess that we have uh, developed to describe certain things, certain tendencies, certain ideas. Um... You know, you, you say X exists, and the obvious riposte to that is prove it. Um, now, when we say, if we want to say that 
bad exists, then everybody just says, okay, just turn on the news and watch what's what's going on in the world. And again, I've said, is that bad? Or is that just profoundly undesirable for the people involved? Um, you know, the usual Western response to that is to pour on the sandbagging, the guilt and the shame. Um, you SOB. I remember a, a Bukowski short story called Beer at the Local Bar, where Bukowski goes down to the bar, in his usual, it's where he spent most of his life, was on a bar stool. And um, people ask him about some particularly tragic item on the news, and he says, well, it really has nothing to do with me. I, you know, I, I, I know about it, but it didn't really affect me that much. And, of course, all the bar flies are attacking him. Now, the interesting thing is, if you've spent a lot of time in bars the way I have... <laughs> <laughs> um, you understand that you think that you're going into some sort of, I don't know, alternate world where you're, you're doing something that's kind of sordid and disgusting and you're, you're a little bit lowering your standards by hanging around in bars. And you sort of think, all right, we've kind of, we've sort of, when, by stepping in here and having a couple of drinks, even if we're not going to get smashed, we're, we might get slightly intoxicated. And, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of in a place where the normal rules don't apply and we can just be ourselves and secede from society for a while in this bar while we do this kind of lowbrow kind of stuff. Now, these bars are just as full of politics and backstabbing and rumor-mongering as any other part of society. Uh, and he illustrated that quite effectively when all the people in the bar who are supposedly dropouts of society ganged up on him for his offense against conventional morality, i.e. saying what most people probably already think, I look at the newsstand and I see all the items on the news and I go, well, that really kind of, there's a terrible war somewhere with a lot of people getting killed and it doesn't really mean anything to me. It really doesn't. Um, you know, I think that that's the way most people are. Bukowski just put it into words, simply because there's so much going on in the world that we, you know, you got to filter a lot of it out. Um, you can also say, okay, I, I read about a guy who suddenly was uh, cured of the most horrific cancer imaginable in Turkey. Okay, a guy in Istanbul is cured of cancer miraculously, and I wonder what's for lunch. You know, that kind of thing. It's just there's so much information coming at you at all times. It doesn't make you a skunk because it doesn't affect you. But again, that's conventional morality with guilt and shame. Um, but if you actually sort of... I think if you're honest with yourself, you say, okay, a lot, of this, a lot of the stuff that goes on in the world doesn't really affect me, one way or another. It should affect you, says who? Says some imagined reality out there. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, he, they're just sort of saying that, in a sense, we're all relativists, and we couldn't be otherwise, simply because there's so much information, so much tragedy, so much wonder, so much, you know, the universe is so crazy and absurd that if you try and form, if you try and place value and evaluate and be an a, a efficient critic of the entire universe, of everything, uh, you don't have, well, first of all, the mind is not capable of doing that, and secondly, you don't have time for anything else. <laughs> um, so, you know, you, are you actually, are we all actually forming an idea in our minds that the good is exists and the evil, and that evil exists? I would say that, no, we mostly just gloss over almost everything in life, and if you, you know, but we also live in a society or a culture or an age where to actually come out and say that makes you a real skunk. Um, so, I don't care. Call me a skunk all you want. I couldn't care less. <laughs> the world has skunks in it. I guess I'm one. Um, <clears throat> now, okay, that still leaves the question of goodness open, right? What, where is the good to be found? Where is the benefit to be found, the absolute benefit to be found? It's to be found the same place that the non-benefit or the anti-benefit or the exact opposite of benefit is going to, ha is going to take place. In your, at the experiential level. Okay. Um, again, show me some actual suffering. I don't want you to show it to me as an example of what causes it. I want you to tell me what suffering or a bad state actually is. Keep the hyperbole out of it. Thank you. What is badness? What is a negative value state? Not what causes it. What is it? Good luck. You're not going to be able to find that. Um, 
And if you do, I'm going to have a field day with your definitions. Like when uh, when something you want is deprived or something that you don't want to happen happens. I would. Uh, sorry, <laughs> all that you're saying is uh, you're just as subjective as anybody else is, because you know suffering is when. I don't get what I want, or when something that I want to happen, or that I don't want to happen, happens. That's subjective. Totally subjective. Relativistic, even. Um, okay, so really, where is good? Well, where is good and evil? Or where is good and bad? That's what I would say. Where is that to be found? Where is value to be found? Um... The problem I have with discussing this with um, a n sort of essentially negative person is w in, in the case of negative utilitarianism, they tend to actually just put that in at the beginning. You say, okay, where do you get the idea that fighting harm is the only thing that matters? Well, I'm a negative utilitarian. utilitarian. Okay, well, that's nice, but that doesn't tell me why you you think that it's uh, that fighting harm is all that matters. It's just like saying, um, why do you believe this, that, or the other, Mr. Muslim? Well, because of the Shahada. La ilaha la Muhammad Rasulullah. Um, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. I'm a negative utilitarian. That's why I believe this. Well, that's not an answer. <laughs> You're not telling me why you believe something. Uh, You're just telling me that I have this hat on, and people who wear this hat think this. Okay, that <laughs> that's not even a bald assertion. That's just saying I belong in this category of people, and we believe this. Okay. Now, you get into these long, rambling discussions on what constitutes anything, and it, it, it inevitably falls down on the whole idea of rhetorical or poetic descriptions of everything. Now, I don't really have a problem with that, um, in spite of what some people might think. When you're trying to describe what pain is, what suffering is, what a negative value state is and everything, you have to resort to hyperbole, uh, artistic de depictions, um, flowery language, this kind of thing, to make your point. Well, um, you're going to tell me that when I, um, I don't know, impale a newborn child on the end of a spear or something like this, that that's not a negative value state? That's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you to tell me exactly what being in a deficit is. Not an example of it. Not relying on imagination. I want you to tell me what it actually is. Good luck. The language is not capable of that. Uh, you have to use hyperbole. You have to use the fear response that people have in sort of standing up to that kind of argument. Um, because, you know, you say, okay, let's for the, say for the sake of argument, I say that badness does not exist. Evil does not exist. In front of a large crowd of people in our society, what do you, what do you think? What kind of a response do you think I'm going to get? Uh, I'm going to get denounced like you wouldn't believe. If I was standing in front of a huge group of people, I wouldn't be surprised if people threw stuff at me for saying that. Well, just because the mob or the herd actually says uh, baldly that evil exists and anyone who's thinking otherwise is a skunk, that still doesn't mean that evil exists. It's just reality is not determined by a show of hands. <laughs> um, and I'll use exactly the same argument in, in demonstrating what's good or whatever. Uh, what is goodness? What is something that is actually good? What would What is the positive? Oh, the positive doesn't exist. I'm a negative utilitarian. Ah, I get it. La ilaha la Muhammad Rasulullah. Again, it's just I put my negative utilitarian hat on, and you know all about me. Um, I've just decided this. And we're back on that merry-go-round again, trying to, to establish what value is, and you can't keep denunciation out of that. You can't keep poetic language out of that. You can't keep art out of it or anything because it is so nebulous. The, the, the same problem results from uh, trying to de describe the good, the positive, the, um, the benefit as opposed to the deficit, the surplus, where you have more than enough to make your existence worthwhile. How do you describe that non-subjectively? Uh, you can't. It, our language cannot do that. Uh, that, and that, of course, that leaves kind of a gap open for people like Benatar to stride into and say that pleasure is all that really matters. Well, this is, <laughs> again, that's that too is the Shahada. That too is just a bald assertion. And they say, well, what else is there? 
our Western logical and non-contradictory way of looking at things has actually blinded us, has boxed our thinking in. Um, again, the scientific method type of thinking, saying that if we can't see it demonstrated and repeated in the same environment, then it's of no use to us. Now, <clears throat> let's look at it this way. I see somebody um, getting tortured. My sense of imagination doesn't need a great amount of jogging to clue into what's happening there and that I definitely wouldn't want that to happen to me. But I see somebody who's in this state of blissful joy. How strong does my imagination have to be to actually see that? How strong does my imagination have to be to clue in to what that person is experiencing? <laughs> it's not so obvious, is it? Well, I suppose one could say that you'd say you'd, I see a picture of somebody um, having sex with a beautiful person, I would say, okay, that's pretty obvious that this person is having a lot of pleasure, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, and it's only obvious in the same way that the person who's being strapped to a, uh, you know, a person who's got electrodes strapped to them and they're being horribly tortured with electric, electrical currents or something, and those two are obvious. Pleasure and pain are obvious. How about the not-so-obvious stuff? Somebody in what I would call white depression, which I've, you know, I've experienced. You're just laying there and you're kind of vacant in a horribly malignant kind of way. Well, you, it doesn't look as bad as somebody with uh, nails in their eyes or something like this, but there's a possibility that a person in white depression is suffering ten times more than the guy with nails in his eyes, but it, he just doesn't look like it. you got to use your imagination. The human imagination isn't up to that task. Um, this book... Oops. <laughs> um deals with that, how people who are suffering from depression and anxiety try to describe it to people, and people don't get it. <laughs> uh, people don't understand what they're saying. There, that's the kind of nebulous good and evil that I'm referring to here. Uh, because, as I say, I can see somebody at a buffet stuffing their face and say, okay, maybe if that person was really hungry, they're having a great old time at that buffet, and, and they're really gaining a lot of pleasure there. If a person is having sex with a beautiful partner, then, um, you know, with nice music playing and incense burning and uh, maybe, you know, soft music, uh, live music playing in the next room that wafts in and you get a beautiful view of the Caribbean or something like that, that person is in a state of pleasure. But how about somebody who's just sitting there, you know, with the Buddha smile? And they may be feeling a hundred times better than the person who's having sex, but how are you going to tell just by looking at them? You can't. It's, this is at the experiential level. Um, <clears throat> that you cannot demonstrate. Um, it requires imagination. It requires intervention from the experiencer. Um, or some sort of idea that, yeah, I've been in that situation before and I know. Not all suffering is readily apparent. And I would say that some of the worst forms of suffering are completely invisible. Um, or at least heavily camouflaged. Panic, anxiety, existential panic, um, horror, depression, deep, deep depression, are all camouflaged. They're not obvious in the same way as, you know, somebody getting flogged by a cat of nine tails. Uh, same thing. <clears throat> Eating a cupcake, having sex, getting a massage is all obvious. Being in a state of existential... Uh, transcendental joy is very unobvious. <clears throat> so what kind of suffering is the non-obvious versus the obvious? What kind of, um, let's call it pleasure even if you like, I think that's a, a wimp of a word, but um, what kind of pleasure is existential joy versus getting your rocks off in a nice environment? Um, you have to either have experienced that or you have to have a very powerful imagination. Um, <clears throat> we require, uh, for the higher or lower forms of positive and negative value, you require an imagination because it's taking place at the experiential level. It cannot be demonstrated. Um, if someone can demonstrate to me what severe depression is, <laughs> um, I'd be quite... Uh, interested to see that.
uh, say, a painting of someone in a state of severe depression versus a painting of someone being physically uh, tortured. Um, <clears throat> it's way more obvious, right? Same thing. Someone having physical pleasure is way more obvious than someone having, I don't know what you'd call it, mental, transcendental uh, uh, pleasure or joy or whatever. That is not so obvious. All you do is, all you see is somebody smiling. You know, okay, you know, the, the, the stereotypical enigmatic Buddha smile. What does that smile mean? Well, you don't know unless you've been there. Same thing with the extreme negative, the extreme loss of hope, the extreme loss of all joy in life, the loss of anything of any value at all. That's not obvious in the same way as a busted leg is obvious. So, um, <clears throat> there is obvious, brute, bad, and not so obvious or subtle or um, camouflaged, bad, there is also the obvious good, which is pleasure. Then there's the not-so-obvious good. How do we demonstrate the not-so-obvious things? With great difficulty, you have to use art, music, poetry, all this kind of thing to try and get, <clears throat> get through to people what this is. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Fourth Movement, is an actual attempt to, to um, you know, da 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 It's an attempt to actually express pure ecstatic joy in music. It's pretty good at that. Um, but then you, you know, you li you listen to some um, some uh, symphonies by uh, Shostakovich, I think, who was making symphonies in Russia during the Great Purges of Stalin. And he's trying to uh, express the extreme hopelessness of living in Russia in a way that would get past the censors. Um, I don't know if it was Shostakovich, but I can't remember his name right now. He was trying to explain with music what it actually felt like to live in a totally paranoid, cannibalistic society where anyone could be arrested at any given moment. And he was trying to do it through music. Because you can't really describe that. If you went to Russia during the Great Purges and walked around, all you'd see is a bunch of people with rather blank looks on their faces going about their lives pretty much the same as anywhere else in the world. All of those people were living in a state of profound fear. How do you express that? How do you express that fear that these people are living in? And living in Stalin's Russia, every... You know, every person had a reason to fear because anyone could be a target of the secret police and you could be arrested at any moment without notice, without ever having committed any crime, um, simply because the system required uh, people to arrest. Um, so how do you express that thick, sticky, clinging fear that never goes away for a second unless you're drunk or asleep? Um, you can't really do that. But I, you, but how about the fear of actually seeing the police coming to get you? That's a different fear. That's obvious. You actually say, here it comes. It's happening now. It's not the fear of something that may not have happened, that may happen and may not. That's anxiety. That's not so easy to actually express in words or show. Anxiety is a, of a different, hidden version of pain and fear. There are hidden versions of both types, good and bad. Um, and they take place at the experiential level. If you think you can demonstrate what it felt like to be in Stalin's Russia, um, objectively, I would say that you're kind of out to lunch. You can't. You can't describe that. Uh, you can't describe that clinging anxiety forever. Um, so again, what do you do? You um, you have to rely on elliptical things. And elliptical things, if you're actually hostile to the other person's argument, are really easy to, to destroy as arguments, again, because of our either-or Western-type thinking, scientific method, non-contradiction, that kind of thing. Um, the problem is, of course, at the experiential level, non-contradiction and burden of proof don't exist. I, I'm i alone with my experiences. So are you. You can't tell me that there's no good in what I'm experiencing, or no evil. And I can't tell you that either. 